Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining our monthly webinar. My name is Ray Steen. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer with Mainspring. We are an IT cybersecurity services firm supporting small to medium-sized businesses, nonprofits, and associations in the D.C., Maryland, and Virginia area. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. We've got a full plate of panelists and experts to talk about uh, some ver very relevant topics that uh, often come to mind in a lot of our conversations. Uh, sometimes it's outside the scope, so uh, why not get everybody together in one room to address uh, some, some hot topics and open up the Q&A, which will be uh, right here in Teams. So feel free to plug your questions at any time. I'll be monitoring it, and whenever we see an opportunity, I'll be pausing and uh, want to make sure that we get everyone's questions addressed. Real quick, uh, diving into the meat of it, this is our objective for the day. Uh, this series is hosted each month uh, by one of our chief information officers and our partners to make sure that we're equipping small to medium-sized businesses, nonprofits, and associations uh, with the information they need uh, to go about managing their business and focus on their mission. So today we're going to meet uh, uh, several folks that are very uh, uh, experienced in the insurance uh, world, I would say, and experienced with business problems. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, how to demystify and uh, kind of debunk some of the myths around uh, cybersecurity and preparing organizations, uh, what uh, first party and third party coverage entails, and just to make sure um, that organizations are prepared uh, if and when a cybersecurity attack occurs. So let's get into our panelists. Uh, I already introduced myself. I want to uh, welcome Stephen Finkelstein, uh, Vice President at XS Brokers. Stephen, thanks for joining us today. XS Brokers is a second generation family owned insurance intermediary with a nationwide presence. They're committed to providing retail insurance agents with leading edge solutions and services for specialty lines of coverage, as well as property and casualty insurance. We're also joined today uh, by Mary Broy, VP of Operations with TWG Insurance. TWG is an, a full-service independent insurance agency committed to providing the proper level of protection and a high level of personal service and attention to clients in the Shenandoah Valley and the D.C., Maryland, Virginia area. Uh, last but not least, we're joined by our Chief Information Officer uh, with Mainspring, Jeremy Keiko. Uh, thanks for joining us today, Jeremy. I think we're going to get into some, some uh, good storytelling uh, and, and experience around uh, what clients are, are facing today and, and what, what kind of questions they um, are going to be asked if they haven't already. Yeah, I think this is a great webinar for us to host. And uh, we, we get questions all the time about uh, cyber insurance and everything whenever you get down to the security of, of your IT, uh, your IT uh, within your organization, insurance is, is always goes hand in hand with that for the liability in today's landscape. So uh, I think this is a timely topic and, and hopefully uh, we can deliver some value today. Sounds great. Just so you know, uh, no need to keep notes. Uh, anybody that attends is going to get a recorded copy of uh, today's webinar as well as some helpful handouts. Uh, and it'll be available for playback uh, within a couple of days uh, or 24 hours of, of this, uh, this presentation. So let's dive in. Some statistics. Uh, I'm not, not even sure how to wrap my head around $8 trillion, uh, but this is the latest Gartner metric uh, that's being shared. Gartner, as you know, a uh, leading research company uh, in the, uh, the IT business, um, estimating that cyber threats are going to cost uh, businesses $8 trillion in 2023. Um, you, know, you, you see uh, a lot of stories uh, in the news. They are real, um, as you'll, you'll hear today. Um, I think those numbers are, uh, are just mind-boggling. A little bit on uh, small businesses having cybersecurity plans. Um, this, uh, this metric uh, came from Immersive Lab's cyber uh, benchmark report, estimating 50% of small businesses have a cybersecurity plan. Uh, I think we could probably uh, share, uh, Jeremy, that uh, that number is probably less uh, for uh, for organizations that we work with, and cybersecurity plans can be defined loosely. Right. I was going to say the the actual fifty percent having a plan. I don't find as a hard uh, <laughs> idea to believe what, uh, whether it's a full plan and complete plan. I'd say that number is much lower. Yeah. Plans may consist of, uh, yeah, I have a plan. I call my insurance uh, company or I have a plan. I call my IT company. So uh, 
Yeah, so this this um, this metric was interesting. Um, I, I think as we define record, it's you know uh, a piece of information around your clients, your employees, um, anybody, any stakeholders. Uh, so personally identifiable information gets exposed in a breach, and the estimate is uh, that a hundred dollars it's a hundred dollars a record. Um, it's going to cost that organization. So if you think about your database, your customer relationship management system. Uh, your payroll system, any of the any of the systems that contain uh, this information, um, that's uh, if you add up the thousands of records, um, this this as you can see, um, could be pretty costly. But a helpful metric I find to to just even estimate, you know, what it might cost uh, to. Uh, and that, that number is probably a little bit higher too when you yeah. when you factor in the reputation hit um, yeah. that that follows alongside of that that uh, that breach. Last but not least, um, just specifics to nonprofits. Um, average um, payout demand rate these days is 70K. I think that that obviously varies based off the size of an organization. Um, some nonprofits I know this is their entire operating budget or exceeds it. So um, yeah, this, this has the potential to uh, completely sink an organization that's out there uh, working in the community. So. Uh, and, and this has morphed from just being ransomware to there was a recent uh, uh, hit where uh, a file sharing uh, software uh, third party vendor got hit and the ransom was actually they grabbed copies of the actual data as opposed to just encrypting the data so now they're actually taking the data and their threat was we're going to release this on the web, you know, so that uh, everybody will know the PII records that you've leaked and all of these other things that are out there so um, continuing to evolve uh, all the time. So let's get right into it, Stephen. Uh, the types of claims uh, you're seeing and what they cost, uh, you're uh, you're certainly in the thick of it. Um, I sure so am. Yeah, yeah. No, that was a great segue, Jeremy. I, I appreciate that. So, of course, we're going to talk about um, cyber extortion a little bit, but I think it's important to understand that cyber liability, when the policy was first created in the mid '90s, it was primarily just a policy that would protect insureds or policyholders from any third party liability claim, for instance, like um, a registered investment advisor, if they were somehow um, disclosing their, their client's information or their client's financial information, their clients would take legal action against them because of that dissemination of those records of that PII. So the policy has certainly evolved over the years and it, it's, it's pretty remarkable to see all of the first party coverages that our carriers are able to provide for policyholders inclusive of obviously that third party coverages that I spoken about previously, but also just um, parties that are able to help solve a breach, parties that are able to help recover data, parties that are able to um, provide notification, credit monitoring services, um, pay out uh, ransomware extortion demands, um, the legal expenses. So of course, to defend the policyholder in court, um, any sort of regulatory fines, penalties, like HIPAA or high tech violations would be uh, some examples. And of course, there's business interruption costs. So in the event that your systems are shut down, you've had a breach, now all of a sudden you're unable to generate that revenue that you were accustomed to prior to that breach, the cost of that reimbursement or the indemnification rather for the policyholder. So the breach, while there might be a breach going on, you have parties that are trying to get you back up and running. And at the same time, you are being indemnified for the lost revenues that you would have been generating had that breach had not occurred. So it's really interesting to see how the policies have evolved over the years. And they're constantly evolving just based off of um, malware that may be out there from hackers, new breaches, new industry uh, claims that um, the carriers have really done a great job at making sure that whatever's out there, we're gonna, we're gonna find coverage for. Yeah. So well, we can talk about. Yeah, go ahead. We we used to, uh, you know, we used to share with business owners that you know some of these policies used to be one, a single page, and you know they've, mm -hmm. they've evolved over time, and it's not yeah. because of anything from the insurance you know standpoint trying to get more complicated. It's that you know threats have evolved, right? This is why you know Microsoft and and uh, the federal government spending a ton of money in cyber defense. You know, we're we're always uh, we're always going to be a bit a bit behind um, in in terms of um, you know completely protecting an organization. There's no no such thing as 100% risk free. So, um, what what of these uh, coverage uh, expenses do you feel like business owners or executives are often surprised that that coverage exists? 
that they don't realize they have it and they could use it? Uh, is there one? Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. So cyber extortion, absolutely. So ransomware demands, um, you know, I've had so many instances where, um, you know, a policy hold, holder will um, come say, hey, I, I went to go turn on my, my systems after a long weekend and I'm locked out. There's a message on my system saying, please wire us three Bitcoin or else we're going to encrypt your systems forever. And we're going to release all of that personal identifiable information, all of the employee records, all of your client records. Um, and if you don't pay us the three Bitcoin, you know, you're done for. So a lot of policyholders are unaware that the carriers will work alongside the insured to number one, try to get your systems back up and running, try to restart you from a safe point, as well as if needed, they will coordinate the payment of that ransom demand to the hacker to get your system unencrypted, as well as provide remediation measures to make sure that that doesn't happen again. What ends up happening is, you know, if, for instance, if you didn't have a policy in place and you do go, go ahead and pay that ransom demand, the hackers will talk to one another and say, hey, listen, let's go to ABC company. We know that they're already good for this ransom demand where they've already paid us three Bitcoin. Let's try to tap, <clears throat> excuse me, let's try to tap the well again. So not only do the carriers provide coverage and that, that ransomware demand, but they're also providing coverage in terms of remediation measures to make sure that it doesn't happen again in the future. And yeah, as you can see, ransomware is certainly um, a hot button issue in the world of cyber liability or cybersecurity insurance. Uh, it's certainly the most prevalent demand that's out there right now. And a lot of it has to do with um, uh, uh, policyholders just not having um, the right protocols in place, the right commercial firewall, antivirus, multi-factor authentication, all this stuff Jeremy's going to talk about in a little bit. But it's important to make sure that your systems are, are up and running. And if you have questions about that, the carriers are able to provide consulting services. You know, we want you to be a good policyholder. We want to make sure that you don't have a claim. This is certainly not one of those policies that you're going to leave on the shelf and, and hope that, you know, you never have to use it. I implore every single policyholder to reach out, to get those breach response um, coaches on the line, to get those consulting services. They're at no additional charge to you. They're a part of the policy premium. So, of course, you can call them up whenever you have a question. Hey, we're thinking about getting a new software vendor. Hey, we're thinking about um, implementing um, uh, a new Outlook update. Hey, we're thinking about um, having a new email or internet policy in place for our employees. Is that something you can assist with? And yes, they can. That's what they're there for. They want to make sure that you're a sound risk. They want to make sure that uh, you feel comfortable operating on a day to day. You know, you're, you're business owners. The last thing you need to worry about is a hacker in infiltrating and, you know, encrypting your system. We want you to go about your day. But when you do have those questions, that's when you can tag in the carriers. That's when you can tag in um, the breach response teams and, and make sure that you're up and running and everything's a OK. Yeah, you bring up a good so, point. Not knowing, yeah. not knowing the resources that are available to you can sometimes, you know, be um, can be you know massively um, time consuming. Uh, so, you know, working into your disaster recovery plan or your incident response plan, uh, those contacts, the protocols, who's calling who, what resources are available, um, a great shortcut uh, to when when and if uh, an incident occurs. Yeah, absolutely. So we throw so, very big numbers. Um, uh, talking yeah. about some, uh, a little bit more tangible numbers, uh, versus $8 trillion, uh, when it comes mm. to an organization, uh, an organization like this, this is an example of a professional services, uh, scenario. Yeah. So this is some claims modeling that we're able to do for any policy holder. And we really base that off of their services that they're providing the revenues, potential number of records that they store within their systems, the type of, um, as well as the type of breach that has occurred. So. Um, you know, in the previous slide, there are a number of different ways that an insured can be breached, that a policyholder can be breached. But in this particular situation, it was a hack. So when you break it down as to what the potential payout for, um, for this insured was, so you look at the breach coach. So that's going to be the team that's going to, again, consult with you, coordinate different efforts between legal, coordinate different efforts between um, an IT computer forensics team. If the business interruption sublimit is triggered, um, maybe uh, a forensic accountant as well. So just keep in mind that if this insured did not have the policy in place, the total cost listed at the bottom there would be something that they would be paying out of pocket. Now, I know that um, I think the average cost of record in, in the previous slide was about 
a hundred dollars a record. So in this particular instance, it's a little bit above that. And if you see in the notification, um, yeah, there you go. So in the notification, so it'd be 15 grand just to pay for notification and another eight, um, 8,200 bucks just for the credit monitoring services. So it is a state requirement that if you are breached, you will have to notify the individuals that are in your system as well as employees that you've suffered a breach as well as provide uh, credit monitoring services to those individuals that would like to sign up. And that's a 12 month credit monitoring services. Um, so again, with, with the policy, you have a team, a legal team that will create that notification letter exactly to the state specific requirements, as well as a party that's able to provide credit monitoring services to the individuals that sign up on that notification letter. It will describe what happened, how the records may, uh, may have potentially been breached, as well as a link or a phone number to sign up for that credit monitoring services for those individuals. Now, um, the regulatory fines and penalties um, and the class action settlements, that would be from a third party liability suit. But as you can see, that would be a large chunk of money for this particular insured to pay out of pocket if they didn't have the coverage in place. So again, we can always provide claims modeling scenarios for you, um, especially when you know, when you're working with Mary to get to get a quote out. So certainly never hesitate to reach out for that. It's it's extremely um, very streamlined process in order to do that. But, um, you know, if you ever are, are wondering, you know, oh, yeah, you know, I, I, you know, what's the real cost of the breach? This is it in, in this particular example. Yeah, no, this is a great breakdown. I love I love seeing the numbers in each of the sections because it kind of maps, you know, what you're about to go through post incident. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I think we can all agree nobody wants Nobody on this call and the other side wants to be paying this. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. To avoid it altogether. So thank you, Stephen. I appreciate it. Yeah, of course. So Mary, next step would be, uh, you know, putting pen to paper and, and kind of understanding uh, the nuances of the types of insurance and and, and what cover and coverage exists and why you need it. So if you could uh, kind of take some of the typical questions that come from the field uh, when you're working with organizations. Yeah, thank you. Um, as Steve indicated, just to kind of uh, start this off, as Steve indicated, the policies have really evolved. And so not only do you get the coverage, but you also get those risk management tools such as, you know, assessments and some employee training. So we hope today that you leave here wanting to have the cyber coverage question, um, conversation. Um, so these are some typical questions that we field. Um, I'm a small business. Well, unfortunately, small businesses sometimes lack security and technical expertise. And 40% of cyber attacks are targeting small businesses. Um, so that's a pretty big number. And I think the less than 15% of small businesses have actual cyber coverage. So there's a lot of opportunity out there for um, for attacks and targets. And then the great um, internal IT department, that's wonderful from an underwriting perspective, uh, but unfortunately attacks can still occur. There can still be a human error or um, you know, some way to, to access data that you know, was not um, realized. And then we hear this often that, you know, you don't take credit cards, but that is not the sole purpose for having a cyber policy. Um, there are so many other records and uses of technology today in business that this is kind of, um, you know, very, very um, preliminary and, and I think we're we're getting some feedback on your end, Mary. Anybody else hearing that? Yeah, that's uh, yeah. There's an there's an impact. We're Not relevant. Have. There we go. Um, oh, Mary, Mary, we're we're uh, getting a choppy signal from you. Give me one second. There you go. Are Can we you okay hear me now? now? I think so. Yeah. If you could just, uh, yeah, I think we we talked about the internal um, yes. IT department. You Can mentioned. you hear me? Okay. We, yeah, yeah, the credit card part uh, uh, is, is kind of where we uh, left off, if you could finish the thought there. 
Okay. Um, the credit cards, that's really not the sole purpose to have a cyber policy or protection. Uh, there's a lot more, as, as you'll learn here today, a lot more coverage that um, is in a policy. And then the data stored in the cloud, there's a lot of misconceptions about who bears that responsibility. Um, quite frankly, if I were um, a target for an attack, I would not want to rely on someone else's policy to provide coverage for that. That's a great point. If I could, if I could throw one in on the pile here, tell me if you've heard it. Uh, I don't have anything worth stealing, so I don't need to have insurance or protection around that. Do you, do you get that a lot? Yeah, a lot of what we get is they just don't think that they'll be a target. But yeah, the yeah, people don't realize how much data they have, even if it's their own employees' information. They certainly have all that that's personally identifiable. I mean, Jeremy, you might uh, weigh in on this. Uh, oftentimes, that's not the point, right? This is a numbers game, and small businesses are there's an incredible amount of small businesses in the world. Yep. And yeah. uh, the point is, it's not, not feel it. Yeah. It's not always the data that you have either. It's a matter of, hey, we can, you know, if somebody gets a foothold in your infrastructure, we can shut you down for a period of time if you don't uh, pay up or whatever that, that impact is going to be. And the fact of the matter is, is that small businesses are the easiest targets to hit because they have less resources for IT spending. They, you know, and everything, you know, and a lot of other factors that go into there. They're not doing, well, we'll get into those pieces later. But it goes above and beyond the data that you have to steal. Many small businesses are a target as a jumping off point into to widen the footprint of, of the attack. Small businesses, like I said, can be strangled out of operation uh, until they pay up as well. So it goes above and beyond just, uh, I don't have anything of value to take. Yeah, just the business interruption alone obviously has a cost. And in, in sure. the example, uh, if you're in professional services, um, it, you you know your your livelihood in your billable day um, is is um, you know being uh, taken hostage. So um, that's why you see a lot of these ransom um, amounts that are being asked for are if they're smart, somewhat reasonable, right? Because it's a numbers game, and they're trying to um, they're they're trying to make sure that you know out of 100 businesses, how many of them are going to pay a reasonable ransomware uh, for us to just unlock. Uh, and let them back into their business. And the wider they can get that footprint, the uh, you know, their their the odds increase in their favor. Right. So, Mary, tell us a little bit about different types of cyber coverage. Um, yeah. So, liability we refer to that as the third party coverage. Um, that would be an example where a hacker obtains sensitive information from your computer, and your customers bring a claim against you. For for allowing him to him or her to have access. Uh, so generally there's a limit associated with that. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and it, in the case that that happens, there's certainly uh, a breach response that you're required to um, act upon. The, the cyber coverage would provide a, um, the cost for those notifications to those individuals, and then the ongoing credit monitoring the cost of that and various states have different rules and regulations around that and the insurance companies know exactly you know what they need to do for for different individuals in different states uh, probably the one that is um, that we see a lot of uh, recently is the cyber crime and that's where if you would suffer a loss um, due to unauthorized access that results in you know a loss of your funds some of those could be uh, cyber crime, could be like an impersonation, someone impersonating you to call a financial institution, um, a supposed email from a vendor changing some routing information, uh, various measures. They're getting uh, better and better at this all the time. So there is crime coverage under the cyber policy that would protect you in these types of events. And then the business loss, we talked a little bit about this earlier, um, the loss of income or the even extra expense that you would incur if you have a disruption because of a, a cyber attack. And uh, one of the things that I think people um, don't think about is the, the cost of your, you know, your reputation and the harm for that. So there is some coverage built in for that as well, um, especially if 
if the event is hits the media and you need, you know, some assistance getting people to uh, continue to do business with you. I think uh, I think probably the, one of the more sophisticated uh, cybercrime, uh, if I could share a, a quick quick one, is uh, a text message between two employees, one being the CEO, one being somebody, um, and uh, one of our actual uh, one of one of a like a, a, a third party that usually does transact business. Uh, and a uh, text message came over uh, naming two technologies that the company um, used. And they knew that because of the technologies that were uh, logos that were present on the website. Uh, and um, the phone number was even close to the similar phone number of the CEO. And they were able to make that, that transaction. So, you know, the information that you put out there, we all know this, uh, right, can be used against you and that social the social engineering aspect of it's getting more sophisticated, but um, you know, fortunately, we're you know continuing to develop best practices. Education is a you know foundational part of it, um, and the and the whole you know see something, say something still applies here, right? The, uh, the, right. I think somebody had put it put it best. Be per um, if you want to be uh, safe, be rude. Um, you know, if somebody sends you something, maybe pick up the phone and or text them separately and ask, "Is this from you?" I thought I always feel like that's been uh, the, the most brief and concise way of uh, of sharing kind of you know where where organizations need to be today. So, from yeah, a business yeah. loss perspective, is there um, how how does some of that get calculated? Um, you know, how, how do you work through that with an organization? Uh, is, is this uh, you know looking through? You know, uh, trends of revenue um, and opportunities that are sitting in, in a in a pre-sales position, or how complicated is that to calculate? Yeah, it's um, it's fair. It it can be considered complicated, but it is a financial look back, um, mm -hmm. and you know, certainly the extra expense is is something that is would not be on the financial records, but the the loss of business certainly they go back and. Um, Look at prior like terms, and and if your business is seasonal, obviously you know you would take that into account as well. So you do need to have some good financial records to support that. Okay. Got a uh, a question in here, Ray. I don't know if you want to hit this now or when we come back. Um, coverage options between providers can vary widely. What recommendations do you have for researching or pinpointing the right option for your business? Yeah, that's um, definitely, there's no, um, you know, template for cyber coverage and, and policies. And so I would just encourage you to, or um, whoever asked that question, to engage a, you know, an insurance advisor to look at the different coverage options and tailor those uh, to their needs. I, I would imagine, Mary, that you know, there's specific scenarios that are keeping people up at night um, that are always a good place to start, whether that whether the business owner has either heard of, read about, um, or, you know, maybe they've experienced in the past. And that's probably the best place to start, right? Um, just yeah. going into it with specific scenarios um, and the financial impacts that, you know, you're, you're afraid of and how it's going to impact the business uh, to just start that conversation. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, we, got, we got some trends here. Yeah, so one of them is is kind of touching on that question. Um, cyber coverage, we're seeing a lot more insurance carriers throw some what they call cyber coverage into a traditional package policy. So if a business owner has a, a package policy, that's generally property and general liability coverage, and they are throwing some cyber in. And um, what we're seeing, and we even have companies that do this as well, and, and we take advantage of it in some situations. But what you need to be careful about is um, traditionally, those are uh, very low limits of coverage, and um, the coverage itself could be inferior. And it may only address, you know, one line of coverage like third party or liability, not the the um, business loss or the breach response or um, the crime. So you just have to be very careful with that and um, make sure that you know what you're buying in that uh, and, and what you're paying for there. Okay. And as so, far as so basically deep dive into that, if that's part of your package. It behooves you to have a second conversation with your, you know, with your current uh, partner about what exactly that that entails. 
Yeah, I would definitely um, not want that to be in place of a standalone cyber policy, but uh, we do like to have those conversations with our clients just so they know what they're what they're getting if that if this is the way they choose to to um, provide coverage. And then from a limit standpoint, um, the Winchester Group generally quotes cyber limits of uh, no less than one million. Um, but we're seeing actually seeing requests from our clients that are in the two to five million range right now. Um, and you know it's very hard when clients ask us what limit to use or what limit they need. Um, it's that's you know a very hard question to answer, but. Uh, we do generally start at the million dollar limit. And then kind of along the same lines of that, we're seeing requirements, um, depending on you know your operation, we're seeing requirements that where um, some of our business owners have to show proof of cyber coverage now in order to perform services or um, to even access you know a job or a project. So that's something kind of evolving um, you know, from several years ago, where a traditional certificate of insurance was general liability and workers' compensation, uh, now we're seeing a request for cyber. Well, and I think that that uh, if you would agree, uh, we are in the area uh, of the world where contracting with the government and subcontracting uh, with partners for government work uh, is highly prevalent. So I think that that's something that uh, you know most. Most folks, uh, if they don't already have, uh, should be requiring right with their partners that they have proof of insurance uh, beyond uh, the general liability, but more in the cybersecurity realm. Absolutely. One question on the limits. I um, I'm curious. You know, Stephen had put together a scenario about the cost of each parts of that um, of a breach. Are the limits going up? People are asking for higher limits because the cost of responding to those those incidents going up is it is it just um is it parallel i think so yeah i think people are becoming you know you're, you're getting those requests from people that are becoming more aware of you know what what could happen or what might happen it's it's not a question of if it's a question of when right so um they're getting a, a bit more savvy <laughs> well thank you mary appreciate that the trends are certainly uh, in line with, with I think, what uh, Stephen and, and Jeremy are seeing as well. So, Jeremy, talk to us a little bit about uh, preparing uh, for what seems to be the inevitable um, and, uh, you know, what businesses can do to mitigate risk. Yeah, no, I appreciate it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think uh, we've seen a, a, a huge uptick in the requirements that are coming out of uh, the insurance industry. Um, uh, when applying for uh, cyber insurance or going through the renewal process, we've seen these things change uh, drastically over the last three years. Since uh, when when everybody started going heavily remote uh, in COVID, we've seen a high uptake in the number of claims that were being uh, put through and different things along those lines. So uh, obviously, the the checklist that is is going on to qualify for insurance varies between the providers that you go through. And I think there are, there are um, you know, a wide ranging scale of things that are going through. But typically what we're going to do when we work with a client is we have an audit that we're doing uh, against all parts of their security, their infrastructure, their best practices and everything that goes along with that. And what we're doing is we're trying to gather the most common requirements for insurance. And we've added that into our audit so that we're proactively auditing even before they're getting these insurance renewal requests and everything that comes along with that. And we're trying to incorporate all of the basic um, uh, requests that are coming in against those. Uh, obviously, you know, you hate to say it, but your end users are really your weakest link in any security uh, aspect within the company, right? But because they're the ones who are uh, sending data out, sharing data, working uh, in email and responses with customers and everything along those lines. Uh, and cybersecurity training is, is one of the biggest uh, points of emphasis that we try to make sure that our, our clients are, are participating in to protect the organization, uh, you know, training them to recognize these fraud emails. Uh, Mary started indicating about some of the financial uh, impact of, of people uh, jumping in there, you know, you, you get all of these emails where people will 
send out something saying your password's expiring and they'll give you an email that looks like it's coming directly from Microsoft. It's branded with Microsoft logos. Everything looks real, you know, but there are certain things that are off. The, the F and the T are backwards in Microsoft and nobody, you know, and people aren't picking up on that or something along those lines, uh, or it's a spoofed email, something, something along those lines. So it's a matter of how do you recognize uh, and tell the difference a legitimate email from, from the fake emails. It's how do you protect yourself while you're participating in online and social media? How do you protect yourself in a number of areas? That cybersecurity training is huge in that regard uh, because um, that's one way that you can ensure that all of your users are getting the same material and, and acting and behaving in the same way if they're following along with those recommendations. I, I, I guess I fact. Yeah, go ahead. Jeremy, and, and I should probably know the answer to this. So maybe Mary or Stephen, you can answer this. Uh, a lot of these best practices, right, are, are here to protect the organization. They're also required in order to get certain levels of coverage. How, is there a requirement for businesses to demonstrate proof that these actually exist versus just acknowledging that they have it and signing the paperwork? Well, there's a warranty section on the application. So, you know, we, we want to believe that the policyholders are, are telling the truth when they when they mention that they do have these items in place. Um, but in terms of uh, formalized, like intrusive detection, that's not something that the carriers are are going to do. Um, you know, we're, we're going to take your we're going to take the policyholders word for it that if they've implemented these items, then and they sign off and, you know, we're, we're going to believe that they have those in place if they don't have them in place but they'd still want to get the coverage. The carriers are still able to work with the insured and consult with them to make sure throughout the course of the policy period or typically within the first month of when the policy goes in force that they don't have multi-factor authentication in place. Um, if they don't have cybersecurity training in place, the carriers will work with the policyholder to make sure that they are implementing those items within the first you know, four weeks to you know, six weeks of when we get that policy enforced. Which of these lists of controls do you feel like are um, most scarce with organizations, right? Some of these are layups, right? Multi-factor authentication, we all use that in our day-to-day -day with our banks and, our, and every, every other app. Um, that, that seems to be a, a very common open standard for just people in general and, and, and working with business. But are there certain controls? I'd like to believe there? that. I, I would like to believe that. Yeah, uh, you, you'd probably be surprised in that as well. Sure. But which ones are most difficult to uh, to uh, as far as organizations getting them together? Um, and yeah, like cybersecurity training is one that a lot of businesses overlook because you know they're they're, they're running a nonprofit, they're running a an architectural firm, they're they, you know they're operating as a business management consultant. They may not have that that knowledge. They you know you don't know what you don't know, right? So if you aren't aware of what a cybersecurity training or um, or an email or an internet policy in place for your employees. What what that looks like? How how are you gonna mm -hmm. how are you gonna let your employees know? So um, it, that is one of those items where you know phishing um, phishing scams or compromised emails. Like what to do? Um, you know, as you'd mentioned before, like say something to um, to the IT staff. Say something to um, the individual who um, their email may be compromised in order to get that buttoned up as quickly as possible. Um, Multi-factor authentication is one that we're seeing more and more uh, policyholders implement. But yeah, you'd be surprised on how many times we see an application where they do not have multi-factor authentication and they don't even really necessarily know what it is. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's important for, you know, in order for employees to access their emails, in order for employees to access their company servers, that they are providing that additional step to authenticate that user by way of, you know, uh, whatever application they may use like Duo or whoever it is in order to authenticate that that is who the actual user is that's trying to log in. Um, you know, especially yeah. during COVID when everyone was working remotely as a lot of people were working off their own personal devices like that, it's very easy for a hacker to infiltrate someone's personal devices that may not be encrypted. They may not have even have a password. And then that employee is logging onto their company server well, that hacker is just waiting for that to happen. If there's no multi-factor authentication in place, it's extremely easy for them to gain access without anybody knowing. Yeah, and and quite frankly, they they'll sit you. They can even sit in your email for a period of time, Absolutely. and they're looking for 
uh, an invoice to be sent. They're looking for different things to go via email. And what they'll do is they'll squat on that, then they'll redirect a message to themselves, and then they'll interject themselves into the conversation, trying to change a routing number for payment or something along those lines. And all of yeah. a sudden, a $10,000 invoice is now being paid to somebody else. Um, you know, and and, there's, yeah. uh, and it's not even little... just the insured. It's in, in that I just had one yesterday. It's wild that you're bringing that up. I had an advertisement agency yesterday that had an, an invoice manipulation claim, which is exactly what you're saying. So there was a hacker that was waiting on the in the insured's um, email address and that advertising advertisement agent's email address, and they knew that they were going to send over an invoice to their client. They um, they hacked the invoice so it looked like it was actually coming from that advertisement agency, but they changed the routing numbers. So when that client ended up paying the invoice, they ended up paying the hacker. It was a pretty sizable chunk of change too. They ended up wiring the hacker $200,000 as opposed to wiring the advertisement agency $200,000. And we're providing coverages for that. So the invoice manipulation claim, that's one of those items that, you know, if you have coverage on like a bot policy or a GL policy or a throw in cyber, it's certainly not going to be covered. So getting a monoline cyber liability policy is being able to get those coverages in place, get the right coverages in place. It's really pertinent, especially for, you know, small organizations. If, yeah, I, I, I would just, if you can go back one slide there, right, because I think the biggest, that, that is the biggest one, I think, that I would want to emphasize to everybody, because you'd be shocked how many people don't have it is the multi-factor authentication um that the mfa is easy to deploy uh but it, it's resisted heavily from whether people don't want to deal with the annoyance of it or or whatever the factor is but the cost of it certainly uh you know on the back end there, there's no better value than investing in multi-factor authentication for all of your apps uh, that are, are accessible from outside of the network. So I would heavily, heavily, heavily emphasize that. The second one uh, to heavily emphasize is the need to have a business continuity plan of what are you gonna do when, when your business is impacted. Those, those are the, that, the training, those are the top three things that I would put on here if I were to, you know, to put these out of here that if you don't if anybody attending this this meeting doesn't have any of those three in play please 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 put it on your roadmap to get these things rolled out um within your within your network so yeah if you want to if you want to think about a business continuity plan it's your playbook when an incident happens uh the cost it's going to take for just one executive for the day to figure out what the game plan is the business continuity plan will have paid for itself uh, uh, and and I would also add, and this is a little bit of my emergency management background with the Red Cross and FEMA, is that um, a lot of value is gained just by putting it together because you start un having conversations that would never happen if you hadn't thought through some of the scenarios. So the, just the sheer value of working through putting together a plan opens your eyes to other opportunities to streamline things, to think about the people that are impacted um, and find other gaps that you may be overlooking. But I, I, as I say all this, I'm also looking at that bottom one for data. I'm like, this is really 1A, 1B, 1C. 1D. These are all critical yeah. things that you guys need to have in there. Uh, but the biggest thing I want to emphasize on data backup right now, just because this is another common thing that we see uh, in terms of breaches uh, and recoverability, is that a lot of new clients that we come in and start working with, when we go in and look at their backup scenario, their backup is actually managed with their local Active Directory passwords or different things along those lines that have then been corrupted. And once they have access to that, they can corrupt your entire chain of backups as well, leaving you crippled. You need to have those air gapped and separated with different credentials from what is used for primary network connectivity and everything that goes along with that to make sure that, and again, once they're encrypted locally, that likely syncs to your offsite backup as well. So all of your recovery abil uh, recoverability at that point is out the window if, if you're not set up properly. So I'm not, I know this isn't supposed to be a scary, you know, doom and gloom thing, but again, this is the part of me as a consultant that I'm like, I just want to emphasize the importance of these deals. So part no, of my soapbox. I mean, yeah, it's, it's a lot to, to swallow when you're looking at all, all this information. So you kind of pointing out some of the, you know, the, the most important wins here, uh, I think helps. 
Yeah, and so, you know, looking at our, our regulated industries, and some of these things go above and beyond just the regulated industries, but, you know, knowing the, the, the uh, compliance policies for your industry, uh, making sure that, that, again, emphasizing the training of your end users, um, you know, if you've got requirements for PII, PCI, if you're running credit cards, all of the policies that you need to have in place, if you're running credit card transactions within your organization, you need to have a thorough audit of your PCI compliance. Uh, if you're storing PII data, the same thing. Uh, because again, if this data gets out, those are those are going to be the costly events of notification and, and everything else that goes along with that. Um, and again, you want to say we can do everything we want to protect it, but you know, then there's, uh, you know, you read in the, in the paper every day about uh, uh, credit card numbers being stolen from a Home Depot or from, you know, these these uh, billion dollar uh, industries that are, are, I guarantee you, uh, you know, their security uh, budget probably dwarfs most small businesses entire uh, revenue stream. So, you know, it, and they're still getting compromised because of, and it's normally due to a weak link along the line, whether it's an end user um, error or something along those lines. But uh, so making sure that those pieces get up to date. Uh, looking at the third party vendors specifically, um, again, a number of uh, leaks have come out of third party vendors that you're working with and making sure that you're doing an audit of their security practices and everything that goes along with them. We've seen it with AMS systems, we've seen it with uh, cloud hosting services, we've seen it with, you know, a number of different third party vendors, where those leaks have come in from from those areas for no fault of the small business directly. Um, so it, 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 you want to make sure that you've got those things shored up uh, and addressed as well. And, and when you're looking at, at third-party vendors, also look at your partners that have access to your data. If you're a membership organization and your members have access to the data that's in your, your uh, AMS system uh, and different things along those lines, are you requiring them to use multi-factor authentication? Are you requiring them to attest to their security practices within their organizations, you know, and passing that 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 along because these are some weak points um, that, that could really seriously uh, impact your your overall security when it comes to a breach. Yeah, Mary, you mentioned this uh, or touched on this uh, in one of your uh, slides that you hear. Well, my information is up in the cloud. Aren't they responsible for it? Um, I think this kind of speaks to, to that, right? The movement to the cloud and using cloud applications and third-party solutions for, you know, warehousing information that's specific to an organization is going to continue. So is there something more specific um, or actions that organizations should take? Um, I'll ask the, the whole panel. Uh, when it comes to third-party vendors that are in the cloud, uh, is it, what's the first, I guess, step that, that should be taken um, with those vendors and, and uh, what questions should be asked? Well, I think it's important to to understand that whatever information you're storing on the cloud, your client's information that you're storing on Amazon Web Services, you know, you're storing on a cloud service provider, your your clients don't know that you're doing that. At the end of the day, it's still the entity's responsibility. It's still the insured's responsibility to pay out for any potential notification, credit monitoring services, any third party liability suits that come along the way from a breach of that information from that cloud service provider. So it's, and then at the end of the day, the carrier, the insurance carrier would indemnify <clears throat> or go after that cloud service provider in order to recoup some of those losses. But if you're the policy holder, th it, it would be next to impossible to be able to try to recoup some of those losses from you know, your cloud service provider directly. You, you, need, you need help. And it's important to understand that. I think that's a great point. I think, you know, the biggest key I would recommend is making sure that you're you're reading the terms and conditions and fine print, you know what their stance is and you know what their 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 take is against everything. Um, and as as part of your negotiations, kind of be asking some of the same questions that are on your uh, cyber audits uh, and your requirements for insurance to make sure that they're complying in the same manner. So uh, we do have a question. Um, yeah. I was going to share this with the crew. We got about 10 minutes left. So if you've got any questions that you haven't plugged in, please feel free. We've got a few minutes left to, to address them. Uh, one that came in a little earlier was uh, what types of situations or incidents would cyber insurance not cover? Who would like to address that? 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's a it's a pretty pretty broad question, but it's important to understand that the purpose of the cyber liability policy is to provide those first party coverages and third party coverages as it relates to a breach, unauthorized access, or destruction or deletion of the data in the insured systems. All right. So what we're not covering are professional services. So that's certainly something to keep in mind that we're not picking up any sort of financial loss as it relates to the insured's professional services. For instance, like uh, let's say you're an architect or an engineer, we're not going to pick up any sort of financial loss as it relates to you providing any sort of design work for your clients. But the coverage is there for in the event that your blueprints get deleted, lost, destroyed. There's a rogue employee that's stealing proprietary information. There are, um, there's a hacker that has encrypted your, your systems. There are, um, um, you know, a, a number of different things when it comes to business interruption, you can't get into your systems and you're losing revenue that way. So, you know, it, it all has to do with the, the destruction of data, with the deletion of data, with somebody having compromised your systems uh, in some way, shape, or form, but it is certainly not for any sort of uh, professional services that you're providing, and it's certainly not for any sort of like you know work comp or general liability or property insurance. Like it's a very specific form cyber liability. So I, I hope that answers the question. But um, again, it, it really is about your your network, your systems, and the data that you store on your systems. Great, thanks, Stephen. We've got a few a uh, few minutes left, Mary. Uh, we've we've covered a, a good bit. Is there is there anything that you'd like to add? I think a lot of folks have, have joined this webinar to to really kind of get into the nuts and bolts of what they don't know. Um, and we've covered a good bit here with Stephen, um, Mary, and you know, yourself, and, and Jeremy. What else should uh, businesses know if they have coverage today? You know, what would you encourage them to do? Um, I think it would be a really good idea just to kind of, you know, take a, a deeper dive into that policy or coverage or engage, um, you know, their fund, their insurance advisor to help them with that, um, to make sure that they have all the coverages that we discussed today, the, the third party, the first party, the crime, all of those. Um, and kind of along the lines of what Jeremy spoke to, um, oftentimes, you know, Again, cyber coverage has certainly evolved, but when we first started having those conversations with clients, when we would um, sit down with them to fill out an application, that's oftentimes when they realized what they needed to do. Um, so it's really nice to partner with someone that, you know, can help put all those things in place. But that's kind of the first, you know, we can quote um, someone with cyber coverage with very little information. But at the time of an application, we do need to make sure some of those controls are in place. Um, so, you know, the application will ask questions that make them think about what measure, security measures and, and training and continuity plans and things of that nature that they need to put in place. So we got another question in here, Ray. And if anybody else has a question, feel free to type them in and or if you want to raise your hand, we can we can allow you to speak uh, as well and do something that way. Um, but a question came in in a post breach scenario after notifying your IT provider and insurance, what are the immediate steps someone should do someone should take within their their organization? Uh, I could start with that. Um, Essentially, that's going to depend a lot upon your your industry and your business and 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 you know what you're working there. But I think it goes back to highlight the need for a business continuity plan. That's the entire intent of a business continuity plan, is to either restore functionality to the business, keep the keep things moving, keep things operating. Generally, um, you know, I, I don't know if you guys want to speak on a, on a different level coming from the insurance carriers themselves. Uh, once your, your claim is filed, you know, you're going to have certain actions you're going to have to take on the insurance, you know, uh, as a coming from the insurance side, from, from the IT side, working with your IT provider, there are going to be guidances that are given for remediating the issue, getting you back up and running and different things along those lines. And those are going to be the most critical pieces to go forward, but you're going to have to consider, you know, your marketing, your PR, everything that's going to come out on the on the back end of everything that that, that runs through uh, following uh, a breach scenario. But I think a business continuity plan 
uh, from my standpoint, having that before you need it is key. So, yeah, I think, I think I'm stating the obvious here, but I, everybody works with it every day. So it's no longer a department. It's no longer uh, well, no half our company doesn't use computers to do their work and our stakeholders don't interact with technology. So that, that continuity plan pulls together all parts of your business and gives them the quote immediate next steps, right? Your accounting department, your finance department, um, your, yes, your IT department, even your PR marketing department, your sales folks, anybody dealing with customer service. So if a, a business continuity plan clearly lays out your checklist and your go, you know, your response plan uh, so that you can immediately respond on all, all aspects of the business. It, it doesn't just start and, and end with the IT department and, and let's say finance. And that is what the breach coaches that are provided by the insurance carriers. Once you call on that claim, you are working with a breach coach that's going to assist you at every step along the way and in, in even after the breach has occurred. So what, did, what do you do from here? So they've remediated the issue. You know, let's, let's move on. How do we make sure that it doesn't happen again? And that's what you're working with the carriers on the breach response coaches and doing that is what you're, you know, that is what you're paying for when, when you're buying one of these policies. So we certainly don't just want to, you know, fix your, fix your breach and leave you hanging. We want to make sure it doesn't happen again.